So perhaps one of the biggest things to change in the move to remote work was meetings. Most meetings used to be held in person, but when we're not in the office, uh, obviously they have to happen remotely instead. So this past year and a half, we've learned a lot about how to have a good remote meeting, but workplaces are starting to open up and people are starting to return to the office. And now we've got to figure out how to have a good hybrid meeting where some people are in the room and some people aren't. So we're kicking off the discussion of the new future of work here at the Microsoft Research Summit with a session on hybrid meetings. And John Tong has joined us to talk about what we can expect to see in this session. So John is a principal researcher in the Ability Group here at Microsoft Research, and he's an expert in hybrid work from well before COVID, not just because of the research he does, uh, but because of actually his own experience. He lives down in the Bay Area, while many of us are up here in the Puget Sound, and back when we were in the lab, um, it wasn't uncommon to see him wandering around in robot form, basically as a monitor on wheels. Uh, so John's research focuses on understanding how technology can support collaboration for a diverse range of people. Um, welcome, John. Uh, I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about how collaboration at work has changed over the past year and a half. And, um, you know, specifically what that means as we start thinking about the shift from remote work to hybrid work. Yeah, thanks, Jamie. While the pandemic has given many more people firsthand experience with remote work, that was in a situation where almost everyone was working remotely. Hybrid work where some people are together in a room and others are joining remotely brings new challenges. So even before the pandemic, there have been decades of research on remote collaboration in a field known as computer-supported cooperative work. And we've been able to leverage the expertise in this area here at Microsoft Research to shape the design of new products that we're developing in the Microsoft Teams organization to support hybrid work. Yeah, so, so work has clearly changed. That much is obvious. Um, I wonder if people have changed as well. I mean, have people grown to meet the challenge of figuring out how to work remotely together during a pandemic? Yeah, as we mentioned, we've had the technology for remote collaboration for decades, but our pandemic experiences has increased everyone's video literacy and made joining meetings via video socially acceptable. And this broadens the opportunities for the future of including people from all over the world into activities and events. Now, people have really gone up the learning curve of remote collaboration, not only in using the technology, but the practices of checking in with everyone to make sure that they're getting heard. And a major challenge with hybrid meetings that still needs to be solved is making sure that they're inclusive and equitable, such that remote participants and those in the room are able to fully participate and interact with each other. We need to innovate beyond the standard matrix of video tiles to enable rich and natural interaction in hybrid meetings. Yeah, so I gather we're gonna see a hybrid meeting in action with today's session. Um, can you tell us a little more about how things are gonna get set up? Yeah, what we're gonna show is a research prototype that allows us to experiment with different user experiences for hybrid meetings. You'll be able to see two people in a meeting room interact with three remote people, each joining from their own location in a way that helps everyone feel like they're sharing a common space. And as we learn more from this prototype, we'll be able to shape what future versions of Teams will look like for hybrid meetings. This prototype grew out of Project Malta, which has included MSR researchers from sites in Redmond, Cambridge, UK, California, and Canada, along with collaborators in the Teams product organization. So Sean Rintel, a principal researcher from the Cambridge UK lab of Microsoft Research, will moderate a roundtable discussion of the issues around hybrid meetings using the Malta perspective prototype. I'm super excited to see this session. Um, so with that, let's hand things over to Sean. Thanks, Jamie and John. G'day, I'm Sean Rintel here in Cambridge UK and welcome to my house. I'm joining the meeting from home and as Bill Buxton, our colleague, is fond of saying, if you want to live in the future, you have to have lived in it already. So today we're going to talk about hybrid meetings in a hybrid meeting prototype. Let me take a seat at the table. I'll join the meeting now. So just like an establishing shot in a movie, I can see an overview of the meeting and I see that there's a seat for me. So I'll take my seat. And now that I've joined, I'm zooming in and talking to my colleagues. Hi, everybody. Hi. 
Let's go around the table and do some introductions, starting with our guest, Carmen Neustader. Hi, I'm Carmen Neustader, Dean of the Faculty of Communication, Art and Technology at Simon Fraser University in Vancouver, Canada. And I'm joining you from my office right here. I've been doing telepresence research for a couple of decades now in collaboration with many of the folks around the table today. Hi, I'm Corey Inkpen. I'm a senior principal researcher at Microsoft Research. And just like Carmen, I've been working in this space for a couple of decades now with all of these great people. <laughs> Hi, I'm Shiraz Kupala, uh, Partner Group Program Manager in Microsoft Teams, and I'm here in the room with Corey. Hi, I'm Abby Sellen. I'm a Deputy Director at Microsoft Research in Cambridge in the UK, and I'm joining you from my office in England, and also been working in the space for about three decades now. Well, so now that we've had a chance to meet everyone, let's talk a little bit about what we're seeing in this perspective prototype. Everyone's joined the meeting, but you can see they've joined with their background removed. And that means we can put everyone into a virtual room with a table that everybody sits around equally, no matter where they're located. So I'm in the room with Corey to my left and Abby virtually to my right with Sean and Carmen across from me. And I'm in the room with Shiraz, Carmen's to my left, Sean's in the middle, Abby's to the right. I'm in my house and I've got Carmen to my right. Corey's almost dead on in front of me. Shiraz is dead on but slightly to, to my left. And then Abby is to my far left. And I'm in my office in Cambridge and I've got Shiraz on my left. I've got Corey and Carmen across from me and I've got Sean on my right. I'm in my office in Vancouver, Canada. I see Sean on my left. I see Corey on my right and I see Abby and Shiraz across the table from me. Okay, so let's start by talking about hybrid meetings and what we know about hybrid meetings. Perhaps, Corey, you'd like to start with why have hybrid meetings been a problem for you know pre-COVID and are still a problem and are likely to be a problem going forward? And how can we start to move forward on fixing that? Well, one of the challenges, and I'm sure many people have participated in meetings where you are the remote person, is you are typically the one that gets left out of the introductions uh, or gets forgotten about, and you really don't feel like you're a part of the meeting. So we actually spent uh, a lot of time looking at uh, meetings, hybrid meetings, where one person was remote and how we can give that person a sense of presence in the meeting. Now, as we move forward from the pandemic, where we are anticipating having more than one person remote, this problem becomes even more challenging. Cool. Abby, can you tell us a little bit about the primary room dominance problem of hybrid meetings? Yes, so there are lots of, um, as, as Corey's been alluding to, there are lots of um, asymmetries when we have a hybrid meeting. And one of the problems is, is that we find most of the advantages are confirmed on, uh, are conferred on the people who are in the room. So um, this takes the lots of different forms. Uh, so for example, if we look at turn taking, turn taking is, is, a, is a big problem for people who are remote. Part of this is to do with the problem of lack of presence, as Corey's uh, alluded to. Uh, so it's very hard as a remote person to have a presence and to indicate that you want to take a turn at talk if you're remote. Uh, meanwhile, all the body language and signals that we use uh, when we're together in a room are available to everybody who's sharing the room. So that, that's one of the asymmetries too. Like, for example, it's very hard um, if people are in a room are gathered on a whiteboard or other physical artifacts for the people to also participate in that. A number of other things uh, happen to make um, it more advantageous, advantageous to be in a room. Like, for example, the chit chat that happens before a meeting and after a meeting is something that um, people who are remote often get left out of. Cool. Shiraz, what are our customers saying about their problems with hybrid meetings? Yeah, as, as we look ahead, our customers are telling us that in the future, more and more meetings are going to be hybrid and that the equity is one of the biggest challenges they see with hybrid meetings. Uh, as Corey had mentioned earlier, you know, people remote versus in the room who uh, maintains the dominance in the conversation. And that can vary based on a number of different factors. And they want to get to that point where even in a hybrid meeting, you have that equity, as much equity as you have when you have a fully online meeting, in fact. Don, I just want to jump in here because one of the things I found interesting about today's panel is before we even started, it was not the case that Shiraz and I were talking amongst ourselves and ignoring the rest of you. 
we were very much having a five person chit chat conversation, um, which, which was really exciting that it just felt really natural to be here and to be doing that. Yeah, totally. One of the things I thought was amazing is we we're able to go around the table. I mean, this is very hard to do in a standard grid because not everyone's in the same place and everyone might be even represented in different kinds of ways here because we have equal representation visually and because we all see ourselves in the same relative perspective. Going around the table makes total sense. Finally, makes total sense. Yeah. Which actually, that, that brings me to, to sort of talking about presence in the meeting. Carmen, do you want to tell us about sort of presence in hybrid meetings and the, the sorts of difficulties that, that crop up? Yeah, I think similar to, to previous comments, it's important to have a physical presence in a space in the sense that people remember you're there, that you take up space, that you can be, have a place at the table and people remember about you. Um, and so in this type of environment, because we're placed spatially around the table, we all do take up space and people remember that we're there. In fact, what I find interesting, when I first joined this room, I actually didn't know where people were physically located. To me, everybody was in the same actual place, which really had great benefits to me as a remote person, recognizing you know, we're all kind of on the same level, we're at the same playing field. Is it cool. One thing that might not be clear is, Sean, where are you? I mean, where are you broadcasting from? I'm at home. So this yeah. is, but it doesn't feel, it, it just feels like we're in the same place. I mean, it's funny. There's a little bit of, of dissonance between, okay, you're clearly not in my house, but that's not the issue, actually. That, that distinction, it, like, really goes away very quickly indeed in this, in this prototype. And actually, that's the next thing I actually want to talk about is the, the importance of building for the remote perspective. Do you want to talk about that, Corey? Well, well one of the things that we've seen um, in the past and, and, is a bit of a concern going forward is the focus will be on the conference room or the meeting room and what people get to see on their laptop at home is is a really degraded experience so that is one of the priorities that, that we've been focusing on as well is to make sure that both the people in the room and the remote people whether you're on a laptop a desktop or even a mobile phone that you have the best experience that you can have and again you still have that seat at the table and can be a part um, of the meeting that's going on. And I'd like to jump in there. What's powerful about this too for people at home is today large displays are actually far more economical than they ever were before. So people are turning their dens into an office where they might have a large screen TV that can simulate some of the same experience at home. They're not necessarily at a, at a disadvantage compared to people that might be in a conference room setup like you and I are, yeah. Corey. Yeah. And but Carmen, oh, sorry. Oh, ask Carmen a quick question, because Carmen, you've done a lot of work in the consumer space as well. Like, does this inspire um, ideas for what a family might do or uh, a group of friends? Yeah, we've done lots of work on families, grandkids, grandparents and so on. And I think there are the challenges. Often the kids want the grandparents to kind of be in the same place as them to see their toys, to play with them if they can. And so I could imagine extending this concept to other types of environments moving beyond sort of the boardroom meeting room to, yeah, fa family rooms in the home um, so that people can really feel like they're in the same place and doing sort of the same thing together at the same time. Just jumping on that, Carmen, it, does being in the same place mean that it, it has to look exactly like real life, that we're trying to imitate a real life? I mean, this is something that's quite close to that, but is it necessary to imitate real life to have a comfortable hybrid meeting? I don't think necessarily that it's the case. I think there's sometimes advantages to sort of seeing different environments. Like, for example, you know, over the past year or so, just being able to see people bring their cat into the video from their home as part of the meeting environment makes it feel like you're really getting to know your colleagues a bit more and things that you maybe wouldn't have picked up on in the past. Um, so I think there's advantages to both um, and it sort of seem, needs to be maybe a, a seamless experience in some ways. And I, I just want to pick up on, on that question, John, because I think it's an interesting one. I think uh, for me, what's interesting about um, what we're trying to do here is not to say we necessarily need to simulate what happens in, in a room, but we need to understand what are, what are the things that happen in a room that we can start to imbue the experience with, right? So one of the things about being in a room together is that there's a kind of congruency, there's a spatial layout that lets us all know how to behave and act. And that's one of the things we're trying to bring back here. Another example is when we're in a room together, we all have a different perspective, right? And so what's interesting about this prototype is that I see, you know, four people across the table from me, Corey will see a different set of four and each of us sees a different view. 
And that's also what we get when we share a room together. So it's not that we have to necessarily try and recreate what happens in a room, but we have to understand the properties of being in a room together that we can bring to bear in whatever we design. Yeah, and Shiraz, obviously this builds on teams together mode in a, in a certain extent, but, but goes a step beyond. What do you think is that in the future of together mode and this kind of sort of more virtualized version of the, of the together mode stage? Well, I think as, as um, Abby said, you know, not just being in a common space, but arranging the people in that space relative to each other makes a difference because then you feel like you have more of a spatial awareness. Um, and so when I look at Corey or if I look at Abby or you, right, or anybody, right, now you can even start to see the same kind of experience that we would be if we were in a room. And so uh, together, you know, extending together mode to bring that kind of awareness and then over time, even bringing audio awareness. So I know when someone is speaking from the right or the left, I instinctively will turn that direction. I noticed when you were doing that, actually, you, you gestured. Well, for me, it was you gestured to the right so you could talk about Corey. And then when Carmen and when Corey was talking about Carmen, she gestured to the right at Carmen, you know, which is for me, that's the way it went. But I know it looked really different for you, but it looked really natural, even though you know, in effect, it would actually be quite different for all of us, which is the, the interesting thing about the perspective prototype. Abby, what else you know, can we do, do we know about gesture in, and the importance of gesture in, in meetings and its relationship to, to turn taking, especially in hybrid meetings? So turn taking is a really interesting one because uh, turn taking is something we all do naturally in conversation. And we know that in video calls, it can often be a problem. It's kind of like that thing where, you know, you approach somebody on the sidewalk and and you move to one side and that person moves and you move to the other side. So having to kind of jump into a conversation can be like that, right? You kind of like nobody knows when to take a turn. And then there's these long, awkward silences. So it's something that um, we do very naturally, but we don't really notice it until things break down. A lot of turn taking happens on the basis of what we say and how we say it. So a lot of it happens in the audio channel. And we know, for example, uh, when audio is bad, when there's a lag, that's a problem for turn taking. But a lot of it happens because of um, what we do with our body language. So our head turning and our gaze, they offer a lot of um, important cues for how we do turn taking without having to think about it. And so, for, for example, we know that when we're in a room together, we tend to um, look away from people. If we want to keep holding the floor, we don't want to give up a turn. And then also if we want somebody to speak next, we will tend to look at them. Um, so those kinds of cues um, are often missing for the remote people, right? They just can't see them. And the people in the room are taking advantage of those things all the time. Uh, so that is one of the kind of sources of imbalance. The other thing, and this is something that we haven't really got here, is a lot of the um, gestures and body language that's meaningful will be the kind of the hands and the arms. And that's often missing from the torso view or the view we have here, unless we make an effort to bring those gestures into the frame. So that you know, having people in a 2D box is problematic, right? Um, breaking people out of that box and the, the kind of silhouette view we have here goes some way to kind of alleviate that and give us more of a sense of presence. So there are a lot of things going on with, with body language um, that's at issue. Another thing is the subtlety of what happens in body language in, in when we're sharing a room. So when people want to take a turn, they often lean forward. And if you're in a room with somebody, you can kind of see them out of your peripheral vision, leaning in as if they want to take a turn. Now, people who are remote won't necessarily see that. And they also don't hear a lot of the cues that people uh, give off um, when they want to take a turn. So they often take a, a, a sharp intake of breath when they want to jump in. Now, we don't hear a lot of that if we're remote. So there's a lot of kind of subtlety in the body language cues and the audio cues that we just don't pick up in the remote situation. I noticed when you leaned in that, you know, one of the things about having that virtual table there is that there's you can you can see the relationship between you and the table. So you're leaning closer to the table when you lean in. It's interesting how different that is to just seeing someone get bigger in a grid square and how somehow that seems to seems to imbue just that little bit more of the natural feeling about it. I want to turn to the, the people in the in the hybrid rooms, that's Shiraz and, and Corey, and about what's it like being 
in the, you know, being in that local space, but seeing us there. And in particular, you know, one of the, the classic problems of hybrid is the sense that the local folks form a clique and that they're naturally sort of feeling like they're much more together than everybody else and the others are, are quite different. So what does this prototype feel like from that perspective? Well, the, the first thing I want to say is it is great to be able to be in a room with some of my colleagues. Like I really miss interacting um, and so I am excited that we are shifting to hybrid, so we will have more um, in-person um, communication, but to also be able to extend that, to have sort of natural communication with those that can't, that can't be there. I mean, the workplace is really shifting to this new flexible style of work. Um, like maybe Sean has to, to uh, go pick up a, a, a kid from soccer. He can do that from his car, but he can still be here in the room with us. Um, and so I think that is um, is, is really one of the, <clears throat> the great things about being in person, but also being able to ha have the remote people. You know, it, it was interesting to me, for example, when you were talking and Abby wanted to jump in and that interruption is so important. And then Carmen was 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 talking and came in that that nat the fact that you feel like you're here with us makes it feel like there's one meeting going on and not two, which oftentimes happens, the remote meeting and the people in the room. No, this feels like we're all in one meeting. I mean, if Shiraz and I were joining the meeting both from our laptops, our focus would be here yeah. and not on each other. Having the big display and having all of you on the big display just opens it up and makes the whole room the meeting. You know, what we're doing here is a visual thing, but I think um, as we mentioned earlier, one of the other aspects is the audio experience. And one of the issues I have with things like noise cancelling is that there's good reason for noise cancelling, right? To allow people to have a much clearer um, audio signal and to, to focus on the speaker. But then you miss out all that kind of ambience and, and, and subtlety from the communal experience too, which is part of the energy in a room. Um, you know, so we talked about earlier um, spatial sound. I think redirecting energies to exploring the importance of sound is also going to be really important going forward. You know, whether it's spatial sounds that allows us to selectively attend to one speaker over another, or whether it's um, allowing us to, to speak at once and to speak over each other at once, because when you have a really lively conversation, people speak over top of one another. That's one of the things we do in a video call. That doesn't tend to happen, right? So that adds to that kind of stilted experience that, that we get in the video call. That's so true, Abby. The flow of the conversation and that free-flowing, smooth blend of everyone interacting and, and talking together, that, that makes a huge difference. We don't have spatial audio yet in this prototype, but it's it's around the corner. I mean, yeah. we're we're almost ready to put that in. And the early testing with it will just improve the experience that much more because you can have some of that crosstalk which is really engaging and part of the the creative experience that we're looking for in these types of meetings and so we really think that um, spatialized audio is going to really amp up this experience mm -hmm. but the other thing is thinking about um, for example blind users right how important sound is to them allowing them to selectively attend to one person over another or get a sense of where people are and sitting in, in a virtual room or a physical room is going to be really, really important. Or to be able to tune in to, maybe there's an interpreter, um, you're reading things, uh, that they can now attend to that or attend to what the conversation is. I think it opens up a big space too for people who have different kinds of abilities. And that's a really interesting point, Abby, that, that last thing about, you know, you could you could easily manipulate this environment again from the remote person's perspective to have the set of things necessary for them, including a big view of a of an of, of someone's lips, for example, if they want to lip read or an interpreter or sign language or those things that not everyone sees, but the person who's using it sees. And that makes them feel very comfortable and participate just as just as well. I, I want to bring up a, a different topic, if I might, which is and I think it's a really important one, which is how we in an interaction like this, share artifacts together. You know, in this situation, we don't have a whiteboard, we don't, we're not looking at slides, we're not looking at physical objects, but obviously for a lot of meetings, uh, this is gonna be really important. And you can imagine, for example, you might kind of lay out virtual documents on the table in front of us, but that doesn't necessarily solve the problem of how we look at these things together. So I think that's a, there's a big set of challenges around that which we 
need to be looking, well, we are looking at, but within this particular setup, we haven't started to incorporate that just yet. I think one of the other things we'd hope from this sort of prototype is that it might help with, with meeting fatigue, which has been obviously a huge problem over the course of COVID. Shiraz, what can you imagine about how this might change meeting fatigue? Well, making it more comfortable to meet together with remote and in person, you know, solving some of those gaps around the senses that we lose in a remote meeting and and making that conversation flow, it reduces the cognitive overload, how much the brain has to work to be together and, and communicate. And so the more we can do that, the more comfortable it, is, it will be for people when they need to meet, you know, from wherever they are. Sean, if I could just jump in there as well. I think um, another challenge um, that, that we're currently thinking about is, is the fact that our work days have expanded. Like Shiraz and I are here in Redmond, uh, uh, Carmen is in Vancouver, and you guys are in the UK. And so I tend to have more 8 a.m. meetings, and I'm sure you guys have more <laughs> 5, 6, 7, 7 p.m. meetings. And so one of the things we're starting to think about is how can we have this type of experience, um, but maybe you will participate asynchronously uh, because you can't be there, whether it's a conflict that you have um, or a time zone issue, like how can you participate in a meeting? How can you still feel like you're here even though you're not? here and i think there, there's some really interesting things that we can try to give a sense of presence even to people that can't physically be at the meeting the other piece is um this prototype is very visual uh, but what about people that need to have their camera off we need to have a representation for them um uh, for whatever reason they have to turn their camera off but we don't want them to disappear from the meeting um, and so those are some some other things that we we need to think through Carmen, that, so that's that's overcoming sort of a problem. What about sort of the other side of sort of adding to creativity and enabling more forms of creativity? Carmen, do you think that this kind of prototype can help spark creativity, change the way we think about remote and hybrid creativity? I, I think so. I think the the technology is here in prototypes like this to enable us to do to have new styles of meetings. And I think it's going to take a bit of time for people to understand how to do that well and what are the sort of unique things they can use this type of space for. And that's where the creativity really comes through because I think it's it's more than just what we can do in an in-person meeting. We can use the advantage of having people in different locations, different time zones, different places um, to have new styles of meetings that allow people to expand on their day's work. Um, to incorporate more people into their their meetings and their sessions and really get a, a huge more amount of ideas on the work that they're doing. So expands our possibilities, but it will take time for people to adapt and get used to different styles of hybrid meetings um, because we're so used to having meetings over the past year and a bit where everybody's the same type of situation, which is just remote. Uh, but now we have to adapt to this new type of culture. Can, can I jump in there too? Because um, we've done a lot of research around uh, creativity and remote meetings, and and during the during the pandemic and the all remote situation, we know that having doing brainstorming, um, doing strategic planning, sort of big picture thinking is really hard to do. Uh, it has been much harder to do in the all remote situation. I think that um, going forward, we need to think about three things really. One is to do with what we talked earlier about how we share artifacts together. Uh, things like whiteboarding, playing with post-it notes, all those things that that you know one might normally do in, in a brainstorming meeting. It's something that we really need to pay a lot of attention to if we want to support this. Another is um, serendipity. And so we know that a lot of creativity and new ideas come from bumping into people that you wouldn't plan to normally bump into. And so, you know, there's been a lot of talk about the the problems of not having that water cooler moment or that moment by the coffee machine where you meet someone new and you get a new idea because you talk to them or you start to develop strong ties uh, with people who would normally be weak weak ties, you know, socially um, weak ties in your workplace and you want to kind of build that relationship. And, and that um, impacts creativity. And then the third thing I would say is... Um, one thing about place is that place has uh, it has history for us. We go into the, our workplace and we see things all around us that remind us of where we've come from, what our group has been up to. We see things written on the board. We see books and papers and things that we've built. And 
meetings, video meetings feel like they happen new every time. And, and that really uh, sort of undercuts creativity to a certain extent because we have no sense of persistence. Like imagine if we're in this room and we have things stuck to the, to the walls because this, you know, last time we, we met, we created some things together or we had things scattered over the table in front of us. Maybe we don't need to read them, but we need to re be reminded about those things we created together. If I can just add to that, I think what's really important about what Abby is saying is the use of artifacts in the space that you have. Like I could go and open up a PDF or a file separately and look at it on my computer. And maybe the people around the table wouldn't necessarily know what I'm doing or what I'm looking at. But when the artifacts come into the space, we can get a sense of workspace awareness of who's looking at what, when are they looking at it, and maybe it's something I need to pay attention to as part of the meeting or the conversation. Yeah, one of the other things I was interested in, as well as, well as artifacts, is, uh, and Carmen, you've done a lot of work on this, is this idea of spontaneous and serendipitous interactions and, and the notion of whether or not you can run these meetings not just as meetings, but as always on spaces. So spaces with history and also spaces that are just always there. And they're either always there as little office neighborhoods or they're always there uh, places for, for sociality. And that's, that's one of your specializations. How can you imagine this change in the nature of, of always on meeting spaces, always on spaces? Yeah, well, I think an environment where you can sort of easily walk into that meeting room, um, whether it's a planned meeting or not, and maybe you bump into somebody in the room already who's leaving from their previous meeting, um, or maybe you decide to have a meeting spontaneously by bumping into somebody in the hallway and then heading into a meeting room together. Those are the kind of interactions that I think are really natural in our in-person environments. And if there's ways to have that fluidity into these types of online spaces like we're in now, where you can just sort of smoothly move into the space without having to initiate a call or do a lot of setup, there's real value in that because it allows people to support those serendipitous interactions really well. And another form of, of, of that is the co-working form, right? Where um, maybe I'm really, let's say I'm working really closely with Corey, that we might have uh, an audio video link open all the time so that when we're working with each other, we just glance up and ask each other questions. And that's the kind of thing that we were doing years ago when I was at Xerox Park. Um, we had what was called a media space back then. And everybody in everybody's office, you had a camera monitor video, um, sorry, camera monitor, uh, mic, and speaker, and you could play around with those connections and have those open connections if you're working closely with one another. Privacy implications come out of that, privacy concerns, um, but you, you can design around that and, and make sure that people are comfortable with how, how that works. But I think it's really interesting to think about expanding our notion of what we mean by meeting, right? So this is a kind of planned meeting, small group size, We've talked about serendipitous connections and kind of open spaces where people bump into each other and that kind of co-working link. They're all kind of meetings, but they're, they're not similar to, to one another. They're all very different. I think the yeah. other thing that's powerful about this too is this prototype that we're in is actually based on a lot of existing technology. And so making this more accessible to more people is one of the goals that we have. And so when I think about, you know, you mentioned together mode earlier, we have the NDI capability for extracting the, the video streams to create this environment. Many of those pieces exist today. And so we will be able to get to this kind of experience for a wide group of people at, in a very cost effective way, which was not possible before. And I think that's very important for us from a product standpoint is very important. Well, let's actually stay with that. And you know, given, given that, what sort of uh, changes to, to meeting room infrastructure do you think we would then need to support this working really well in the you know, for the hybrid folks and so that the remote folks can, can get a great view of them and, and sound from them? That's a great question. There's several layers that need to shift, right? The, the way we display video will have to shift. The way we um, capture and render audio will need to change. We talked about spatial audio earlier. And the, the cameras particularly to get the right views of the people in the room so that the remote participants have a good not you don't want the side view you don't want the you know the the, the odd angle um, all of that in the room is going to have to shift so that the remote view is just as good as what we're seeing in the room and i would add to that giving remote people more control over where they look and how they appear in a room right you know at the moment in a video meeting if the people in the room determine how, how the remote 
person is displaying. And maybe I don't want to be full screen at, at the front of the room when right. I join the meeting. Maybe I want to be at the back or at the side, right? So we need to give remote people more control and agency over how they appear and how they're heard in, in a hybrid meeting. What about if we would go maybe a bit more exotic, Corey, if, if we could if we could add some more things in, like you know, it could be telepresence robots or whatever you like. You know, how, how do we then take it to a next level you know, for a, a future horizon? Well, there's two things that just come to top of mind. First, um, as others have mentioned, is the cameras are really important. Um, and so I can imagine that our spaces will have more cameras and then there needs to be some sort of virtual director that can choose the appropriate camera, whether depending if I'm looking at a side monitor or something else. Telepresence robots. Again, we, we explored this concept for several years. A close colleague of mine, John Tong, he was on my team and he worked for years on a telepresence robot. And he always felt like he was in the room with us. And so yesterday when we were setting up for this demo, we we're all trying to get all the pieces going. We had remote people. We had people in the room. It was truly a hybrid experience. And John was here on the beam, on the telepresence robot. And it was so great. Like it really felt like he was in the room and his having that physical embodiment really felt like, oh, hey, as much as Shiraz is here today with me, it was like, oh, John's here. Uh, he's in the robot, um, but that physical embodiment in the room at times can be really, really powerful. And so um, I would love to see uh, more opportunities um, to have these types of telepresence robots, whether they're in the education space, Shiraz was telling me uh, about a school he knows about that's using telepresence robots. I think there is a, a, a huge opportunity uh, for using that type of technology um, in, in different meeting scenarios or home, family, education scenarios. Yeah, in fact, we just bought a fleet of five robots just to play around with them in the lab. We're having great fun with them. Um, it, and it's really interesting that all the different things that you can do and the kind of playfulness that comes into using robots and driving them around the lab and sneaking up on people and surprising them and that sort of thing. So, uh, yeah, that's a really interesting direction to go in. I love what you just mentioned, Abby, is when the technology, when you start to play and have fun through the technology, then I feel like we're there. Or getting there because now the natural humor comes out uh, versus just I'm trying to accomplish a simple function. I think that improved collegiality too. I mean that's that that's part of us being social and engaging with each other. It, it can't just all be about the task. That social aspect is really critical. And what about uh, something really exotic? I mean not so exotic now I suppose it but not yet um, common, which is mixed reality. Does mixed reality and mixed reality headsets and those sorts of things, do they have a place in this kind of new hybrid world as well? What do you think, Carmen? Um, I, I think they do. I think though the challenge is if you do have a headset on, sometimes it's hard for your colleagues to, to see you. They don't see your face anymore, perhaps. Um, so I think there's a way to do it, um, but we need to continue to advance that kind of technology um, because you know I think we want to see our colleagues around us and we want to understand what they're looking at. Um, so it needs to be a natural experience for both parties, both the person wearing the headset and also others around them. If we're using headsets, presumably that also, that may mean that we also are seeing avatars of other people, three-dimensional, you know, life-size avatars. I mean, what do you think about those avatars and do you think that will change the way we'll have these kinds of meetings? I think it's going to depend on the representation and how it appears. I think going back to the previous point about people who need to join a meeting like this, maybe with audio only, how are they represented? I think that's extremely important because they need to fit in with the style of the workspace. If it's a very professional setting. They probably need to be represented in a very professional way. But then if it's a more playful setting, like maybe you're a very close knit team and you want to have that bit of sense of play at times, maybe you need something a little less serious to represent yourself. There's lots of possibilities, but you need to think about what is the setting you're joining? How well do you know those people and what are the interactions normally like? Can I jump in there too? Because I think there's some, been some really interesting advancements in what you might think of as holoportation where remote people are represented in a, in a meeting room uh, more, more and more realistically. And you know that's a really, really compelling proposition. The thing is that when you look at what that remote person is actually experiencing, so let, let's not look at them from inside the room, but what the remote person has to do. They're usually put into a box with special lighting or they're, they're put against a, a white screen. 
special equipment, they don't necessarily have a good experience of it. So the people in the room might have a good experience of that remote person, but not vice versa. And that brings us back to what we were talking about at the very outset of this meeting, which is that imbalance between the remote person's experience and in-room experience. Just to add on to that, um, we did some research on avatar representation years ago, and we did find that there's, there's a very personal personalization of it. Like what I might like might be very different than what Shiraz may like. And so one of the challenges comes in is it's not only how I want to be represented, but how does Shiraz want to see me? So I may say, hey, I want to be a fish. And Shiraz may think, oh, it's completely distracting to interact with Corey when she's a fish. Over time, we're going to sort of evolve our understanding and our use and what works and what doesn't work um, in this avatar space. Yeah, speaking of that evolution, it, it also reminds me that um, actually it was common student Brennan Jones and also uh, Sunny Zhang and Priscilla Wong and I put together this prototype called Vroom, where we actually put a life-size avatar on top of a telepresence robot, just to really take it way out there in terms of what could we do. And that really changed the nature of the embodiment of that of that remote person in the local environment as well, because it, it meant interestingly that you could see the back of somebody, which meant they were instantly recognizable from the back, which a telepresence robot, unless it's specifically assigned to people or has a nameplate or has some other sort of thing, you don't know who's in that robot. But the back of a life-size avatar wearing the clothes of the person really made it sort of clear that it was that person. It sort of added this extra element of, of ownership to it. So there's going to be lots of fun things to play around with in the future. But as we come close to the end here, what I want to, to end with was actually one key point for not the technology of hybrid meetings, but actually the, the best practices, the social practices for having hybrid meetings that anybody listening to this could could implement tomorrow with their hybrid meetings. And let's go around the table again, starting with, with Abby. What do you think is the key best practice that people could implement from tomorrow to make hybrid meetings better? Well, we actually have what's called the CHARM framework, and that C-H-A-R-M. So uh, that's a little mnemonic that people can use when they go into meetings. So C, how are we going to use chat in this meeting? Uh, should we all be using it on our laptop, for example, even if we're in the room? H, hand raising, how are we going to jump in and take turns? Are we going to use a hand raise feature in Teams or are we going to allow people just to jump in? A is agenda, do we want to have an agenda? Do we have an agenda and what are we trying to do in this meeting and to accomplish? Uh, R is recording, so is everybody okay with recording it? And then M is moderator, so do we have a moderator? somebody to kind of look out for chat and for hand raises and to uh, make sure that remote people are included uh, in hybrid meetings. So, so that's a kind of um, useful little mnemonic. And so that's more than one thing. Sorry, Sean. But <laughs> <laughs> you totally cheated there, uh, Shiraz. No, that was great. All of those elements are so important. And, and it's really important for people when they're in the room particularly to remember to include the people that are remote because it's so easy, especially now that we're all going back in the room, we haven't seen each other for a while, to just start chit-chatting, interacting, and forget the remote folks. Yeah. And so remembering to include them, pay attention, and make sure they get a turn because they are today at a little bit of a disadvantage from the room because it's hard to get the attention of everyone in the room. That's very important. I like one of the suggestions Abby made earlier about asking the robot people where, if it's possible, where they want to be viewed from, um, or at least letting them know how they're being represented in the room can really help. On the flip side, I think depending on the technology, if you're in a hybrid meeting, sometimes the conference room, if there's a camera in the conference room, it'll show up to the remote people in, in a window and the people are really, really small and hard to see. So it could be that in some meetings, it's better for me to also connect as an individual, even when I am in the physical room, so that the remote people uh, can, can see me in um, at more sort of full size. But it really depends on what, um, what technology is available in the room. And for me, I'll, I'll throw out maybe, don't forget about it's more than just a meeting room. You know, it's okay sometimes if that kid pops into your view, um, it's okay if you pick up the cat and show your colleagues, um, it's that sort of personal that I think is really fun and we don't want to lose that aspect. Um, so it's really a way to get to know your colleagues better outside of just what you'd see in a normal workspace. Yeah, totally. It really seems like intentionality is the key here, that instead of just having meetings the same way we've always had them, just assuming that they're going to work, just a little more intentionality about what we're doing and who we're engaging with 
will make a huge difference. And then the technology will catch up. But of course, then the next challenge will be, well, how can we use that technology in an intentional way to have more effective meetings and more inclusive meetings? Well, thanks everybody for a, a tremendous panel where we're out of time, although we could clearly talk about this <laughs> forever. Um, but this has been really tremendous and the prototype's been really quite exciting to use. So thanks everybody for coming along. Carmen, New Stater, Corey Inkpen, Shiraz Kapala and Abigail Salen. Um, thanks again, and I hope that everybody's enjoyed this panel on the future of hybrid meetings. Thanks, Sean. Thanks, Sean. Thank you. Bye, everyone.